Hello everybody, it seems that I've been dragged from my deathbed here and so if I appear to uh, be very weak or flop over or something, just call an ambulance. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen and uh, leprechauns, out of consideration for the rules of the Irish Parliament, I'm going to give this lecture in English instead of Irish. <laughs> Last year, I was invited to address this, this same crowd, but I wasn't able to come, and so my speech was carried uh, as a virtual speech. And so I thought, you know, that would be it. Usually when you have these award ceremonies, you try to invite a different speaker every year. So I didn't think I'd ever be invited again. <laughs> Naturally, I sort of blew my wand in that speech last year, so I don't have anything left to say. <laughs> um, I spoke, so if I want to start off by repeating everything. <laughs> again, this is sort of born in desperation here. It's in last year's speech, I, I did speak about a subject that's very near to my heart. And I think it's very near to the organizers of this event as well, because we can all see from these logos displayed, it is the Irish rather than the English who are hosting this extremely significant celebration of the English language. So I'll start with the same point that I made last year. I told you that the English language does not belong to the English. I pointed out that many of the greatest writers of the English language came from countries which were arguably the object of brutal colonization, exploitation, and misrule by England. Ireland, of course, being a shining example of a non-English source of incredibly great writing. One only needs to think of Joyce, Wilde, or Yeats to realize this. Indeed, the expansion of English into the world's preferred literary language appears to have coincided with a shrinking of England as a world power. So, when you read a novel by Joseph Conrad, who was a Pole, or Salman Rushdie, who was an Indian, or even one by myself. You are enjoying the fruit of a global pollination, a fruit more exotic and more multicolored than England ever dreamt of. And I haven't even mentioned America, whose relationship to England was famously described by a great Irishman, George Bernard Shaw, as two countries divided by a common language. You have every right to choose English as your tool, and even an obligation to do so, because by doing so, you will reach the most widespread audience in history, an audience whose size Shakespeare could never have suspected when he created those astonishing plays, whose side effect was to propel an obscure dialect from an isolated offshore fragment of Europe to the status of a world language. But when you choose to use English as your tool with which to express yourselves, are you in fact donning a mask? Aha, uh -huh, I've cleverly got to this subject. <laughs> <laughs> Masks are our assigned topic today, so I would like to talk about them for a little bit. When I was about 10 years old, I wrote a play called Electra, which was inspired by the Greek tragedies of Sophocles and Euripides. This was one of the brief moments in my life when I was in Thailand. Um, I was seven years old and we came back here for a few years and I was put into the Bangkok Patana School, which at the time was an unlicensed illegal school, uh, which um, had to be closed down by the Ministry of Education. Um, as a result of it being illegal, there was no real curriculum. So because of that, we had this brilliant teacher, who firmly believed that school should never get in the way of an education. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nobody has quite too many school teachers. <laughs> um, now, 2,000 years have gone by since the great tragedies of Euripides and Socrates. So, Naturally, I modernized the story a little bit by having all the deaths performed on stage in the most gruesome manner possible. 
In order to make this production more authentic, our teacher taught us to make papier mache masks out of old newspapers. We would soak these papers until they got completely soggy, and then we would place them on these clay molds, and then we would paint them and varnish them and wear them. After a few days, the soggy papers began to exude a foul stench because they were rotting. The odor from the bucket was absolutely intolerable, and nobody wanted to make masks at all. And the bucket was just sitting there in the classroom, getting smellier and smellier. No one would do anything, and yet the masks had to be made or there would be no play. It was then that Mom Rajamong Samantha took me aside and said, this play is your creation. You are now going to learn that if you have something to say, there is always a price. You are going to stick your hand in that vomitous pail and become the first person to start making the masks or else the play will not happen. I believe this is an important lesson which we must all take to heart if we are going to make a significant impact as artists upon the world around us. So the bulk of my speech is going to concern three very important things which all of you must swear to do. This is not like a vow that you take to become a monk or, or to become married. This is not a public statement that you will be making to your teachers or to your parents. But nevertheless, it is something that you must promise yourself. And here are the three things, okay? One, you must have something to say. Why is this so important? Well, I'll tell you why. Because um, I've had the opportunity to visit, to visit many major New York publishing houses and many book editors. And these people get hundreds and hundreds of submissions in the mail every day. They come in huge packages. They sometimes are labeled in some weird, illiterate fashion. And sometimes they come with postage due, so they, they don't have to read those. And then a substantial number of them end up in the offices of these publishers. And the first editor who published one of my books, who worked for Simon & Schuster, told me that in their office, they have a particular routine for going through this pile of manuscripts, which in the, book, in the language of the book industry, this is unflatteringly unflatteringly known as the slush pile. He said, all the editors in the department sit around every morning with this big pile of stuff. And they open each package and they read one paragraph aloud. If by the end of the paragraph, the whole editorial board has not completely collapsed in laughter, they then assign an editor to read the book. So, if I tell you this, I think you must really remember it. If you have nothing to say, this is probably going to be your fate. After failing the page one test, your manuscript will come back to you in the mail with a rejection slip, and you'll be waiting by the post box anxiously every day with your precious child. You'll feel hideously pained when the rejection slip arrives, and you'll think, why, why, what? But then you must understand that these rejection slips are not anything personal, you see. There are just so many of these manuscripts that you, they just have to have some system for dealing with it. So there are two things that you must comfort, that you must draw comfort from. And because the, the same editor who told me this story also told me that when there is anything even slightly good in that slush pile, it leaps out and they're so eager to, to purchase this property that they'll go out of the way to do it. I mean, this, in other words, if your work is a gem, it will be seen, no matter how much stuff there is, it will be seen. And the second thing is perhaps a little less comforting, but there's a, there is a, a proverb that many writers quote to each other, and that is this. 20 years of rejection flips is God's way of telling you to give up writing. Now, the first way to get past that hurdle is that you better pay attention to number one, have something to say. And now we will get to number two. Number two is this, not only must you have something to say, but you must actually say it. This may seem perfectly obvious to you, but most people don't actually say it, you see. That's, in fact, one of the bases for almost everything that's wrong with our society today. 
Because when you actually say what you have to say, you are going to need guts. You are going to need a certain level of self-confidence. The truth is that in our lives, we generally avoid actually saying what we have to say. The reasons for this are numerous. They are Sometimes they are fearing the judgment of society, fearing criticism, fearing that what you say may be unpopular. Sometimes it's just politeness, you're just, you're just too polite to say. Sometimes, though, you have to realize, you have to realize that when you sit in front of that computer, or if you're very old-fashioned, you look at that piece of paper, at that moment, there's no longer any room for screwing around. Because at that moment, in the split second before your finger touches the first key, there exists an unsaid thing which you alone may say. If you do not touch that key, that unsaid thing will remain unsaid for all eternity. If you type something other than what you have to say, if, as it were, you were to speak through a mask, if you don an identity that is not your own identity, the unsaid thing will still remain unsaid. Only you may say it. This is your gift. In the split second before beginning to type, you are one with God because you partake of the power to create. Of course, as soon as you hit the key, that's another story. And this is where number three comes in. You see, in a sense, number three is what will make or break your career. Because many writers who don't have that much to say and skirt around the responsibility of saying it still have careers. But without number three, they could not have careers because they could not get published. They could not get somebody to actually pay money for something that they've written. Because what you need is this. See, after having something to say, and after having the courage to say it, you must promise yourself that you will do everything in your power to acquire the tool to make yourself able to actually express numbers one and two. In the case of somebody writing in English, that means you must truly master English. Now, as it happens, this is a country that doesn't have a very good reputation when it comes to the teaching of English. Considering that it is a compulsory school subject, and considering that there's any number of special schools and courses, I've encountered more weird English in Thailand than almost anywhere else. This, this is a country where the conductor, Pierre Boulez, and a Blu-ray disc are pronounced the same, as well as a creme boulet. <laughs> they all pronounced boulet. So, so if you're in a... If you're in a restaurant and you ask, oh, oh I think, is that Pierre Boulet's production? Uh, they, they might bring you a creme boulet, I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, last, a few years ago, I was, in a, I was somewhere driving through, through somewhere up country, and I saw a beautiful parking lot. And there were two gates. One of them said, cow, and the other one said, oh. Under the word cow, it says exit. <laughs> Under the word or, it said entrance. <laughs> now, if you have ever studied English in this country, you have probably been advised that English has a lot of rules. Most teachers in this country are very different from Mathuong Most of them love rules. They love to tell you what you're not allowed to do. They'll tell you, don't end a sentence with a preposition. Don't begin a sentence with and. And, I just did. <laughs> and, they'll tell you, the world will come to an end if you put a comma before the final and. Although, if they're from Oxford, they'll tell you the opposite. You may therefore have started to think that becoming a great writer depends upon very much upon memorizing all these rules and disobeying them only on pain of death. Well, I hate to tell you this, but the rules are only a crutch. How many of those teachers, after all, are successful writers? <laughs> Today, it is St. Patrick's Day, and just as St. Patrick drove the snakes from Ireland, 
Today it's my duty to drive a few venomous delusions from your heads. Because learning the rules is actually only the beginning of learning to master the English language. Because it is by thoroughly ingesting those rules, I mean that's why we need the teachers, it is by thoroughly ingesting those rules that you will eventually discover the art of breaking them. You see, the English language does not own you. You do not work for it. It works for you. <laughs> to recognize this and to apply this is the beginning of understanding of number three. So let me read you a brief passage from one of the most influential works of philosophy ever written. No, it's not by Nietzsche or Confucius. It's a children's book called Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll was a weird little mathematician in Victorian England who liked to take risque photographs of young girls. Well, that was a more innocent time. The two books that he wrote, based on stories he told to one of these young girls, have turned out to contain philosophical puzzles, slides of fantasy, and profound meditations on the processes of human thought, which can be analyzed ad nausea by academics and ignored by children. In this story, Alice runs into Humpty Dumpty sitting on a wall, and he tells her about the nature of language. There's glory for you. I don't know what you mean by glory, Alice said. Humpty Dumpty smiled contemptuously. Of course you don't, till I tell you. I mean, there's a nice knockdown argument for you. But, but glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument, Alice objected. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to be, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that's all. Alice was much too puzzled to say anything, so after a minute, Humpty Dumpty began again. They were temper, some of them, particularly verbs. They're the proudest. Adjectives you could do anything with, but not verbs. However, I can manage the whole lot of them. Impenetrability, that's what I say. Uh, would you tell me, please, said Alice, what that means? Now you talk like a reasonable child, said Humpty Dumpty, looking very much pleased. I mean by impenetrability, that we've had enough of that subject. It would be just as well if you'd mention what you mean to do next, as I suppose you don't mean to stop here all the rest of your life. That's a great deal to make one word mean, Alice said in a thoughtful tone. When I make a word do a lot of work like that, said Humpty Dumpty, I always pay it extra. Oh, said Alice. She was much too puzzled to make any other remark. Ah, you should see them when they come round on a Saturday night, Humpty Dumpty went on, wagging his head gravely from side to side, for to get their wages, you know. That is one great philosopher's, great philosopher's idea of what words are for. And I think, pay particular attention to what Humpty Dumpty says about adjectives, because adjectives are sort of, uh, are sort of, you really can make them mean anything you want. It's, it's, you'll learn this as time goes on. Has your teacher ever said to you, that's not a word? Well, if there's a concept that leaves a word, and you invent one, and other people start using it, there comes a time when it is a word. Here are a few words that you probably used recently. Deafening, fashionable, luggage, marketable, majestic, worthless, noiseless, torture, green-eyed, advertising, gloomy, Varied, grovel, zany, premeditated. Every single one of these words was invented by William Shakespeare. Shakespeare made up almost 1,700 words that are still used today. He did it by turning nouns into verbs, by borrowing words from French or Latin and just throwing them into English or sticking prefixes and suffixes on them that no one had thought of using before. If there isn't a word for it, 
Just make it up. Don't listen to your teacher, please. <laughs> English is one of those remarkable tools, precisely because of its flexibility. It is so malleable that it can appear chaotic, but it's not. As a writer of English, it will be your job to mold this language in such a way as to force numbers one and two to take shape. Since what you have to say can be said by no one else, it stands to reason that the language you use will be your own. And if this language breaks rules, then it is up to your powers of persuasion to show that the rules are broken, not from ignorance, but from mastery. You will probably never break as many rules or make up as many words as James Joyce, one of the greatest... <laughs> well, one laugh. <laughs> um, one of the greatest of, of Irish writers, which, and I'll prove this to you by reading you a little excerpt from his book, Finnegan's Way. This novel takes place in a kind of dream world, and in order to make it feel like a dream, Joyce takes the English language so far into outer space that we could probably safely say it has never been quite the same again. And I'll read you the last paragraph of this very, very long book. So we've gone through about 700 pages and here we are. He says this, Sad and weary, I go back to you, my cold father, my cold bad father, my cold bad fiery father, to the near sight of the mere size of him. The moils and moils of it, moan and moaning, makes me see silk so thick, and I rush my only into your arms. I see them rising. Save me from those terrible problems. Two more, on two more, so, ave la My leaves have drifted from me, all but one cling still. I'll bear it on me to remind me of. <laughs> so soft this morning, Thomas. Yes, carry me along, Taddy, like you've done through the toy fair. If I had seen him bearing down on me now, under white spread wings, like he come from archangels, I think I'd die down under his feet, humbly, dumbly, only to wash up. Yes, Tim, that's where. First, we pass through grass, we hush the bush to a go. First, we pass through grass, we hush the bush to a go. Gulls. Far calls, coming, far. End here. What's that? Finn, again. Tay. What's the thing? Memory for me. Till thousands be. The keys to. Given. Away, alone, a last, a loved, along the. Did you understand that? <laughs> no? Well, you should know that the entire book is like that. And yet, literature professors all over the world have more or less come to an agreement about what this book means. More or less. I mean, people spend years studying Finnegan's Way. They devote their whole careers to it. But I'd like you to understand also that Finnegan's Wake is actually a very funny book, once you want to get into it. Well, guys, now I've told you what I consider to be the three secrets of writing, though they would apply equally to almost any, well, to any of the arts, whether it's music or the visual arts. First, have something to say. Second, really say it. Third, make sure that what your audience hears is the real content of number one and two by working day and night to hone your craft. If I had a single piece of advice for you now, it would be this. Don't be afraid of anything. Whatever it is that you have to say, it is your mission to say it. It is why you were born. It's, it is why you were put on this earth. And you probably only have one shot at it. In life, you might be a coward. 
You might hide from the world. You may be as evasive and dissembling as you like. But when you sit down to write, there is, only, there is one thing you will have to do. One thing which every artist must do, if only for the duration of the creative act. You will have to take off that mask. Thank you.
ุณรู้ว่าไหนถามภาษาไทยไม่ได้นะครับได้ถามภาษาไทยได้ไหมครับผมจริงๆพูดพูดไทยได้เหมือนกัน
So, so what I did was I, I broke up the chapter into segments that were in different people's viewpoints. You're separating them out, but connecting the sentences so that one sentence is one person's mind finished in another person's mind and so on and sort of wove it through. So I basically, I borrowed a technique from opera and used it in writing as, as an experiment. Um, I explained this you know, in a writer's workshop in California once and the person running the workshop said, kids don't do this at home. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know, but uh, it's, 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 I, I think that um, different art forms can and, and should pollinate each other and you can get ideas from one for another one very easily. Thanks. I think we have one more question. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so yeah. This question I have actually it's two questions. Is we got three. Oh. I was just wondering, first question is, do you think language is subjective or objective? The second one is, I'm just wondering, every day what language do you think in? And the last question is, have you ever thought about not thinking in any language? Yeah, just that. Oh yeah, this is a, this is a really great subject because uh, it, you hit on something that actually is something I'm obsessed about. Um, in, uh, I'm, I'm, one of those, I'm one of those writers who likes to invent languages for fun and, uh, and have created an entire grammar of, of another language to use in one of my books. So I, I'm very into this idea. So let me ask, let me answer the easy questions first, which is that if I'm by myself, I tend to think mostly in English, except for concepts that don't exist in English. Like uh, menkyo. <laughs> For example, uh, uh, have I, uh, the first question, or the most interesting one, really, it's um, it it speaks to a very interesting thing because uh, my mother translated one of my novels, Jasmine Nights, into Thai. You see, and. It was a, a very, very good translation. In fact, I think it's still the best translation of my work that she ever did. And one of the most interesting things about this translation is that, see, the, the book, it, it's, about, it's about a boy who is in the exact predicament that you talk about. It's about a 12-year-old a boy who's growing up behind a wall to stay in Bangkok, who refuses to speak Thai and only converses in English. And, um, and he lives in a sort of world of mythological images. And um, what I discovered in my mother's translation was that the book had the exact opposite effect that it had in English. Because all the parts, when you read Jasmine Nights, and which originally came out from Penguin, and it was, it was sort of pushed to the sort of exotic colonial literature market, for, which didn't quite fit, but that was sort of how it was marketed. Um, the, the parts that were about mythology or, or Western culture were all very familiar, and they were embedded within this extremely exotic Asian society. But when you read the book in Thai, it was set in a very familiar society with exotic Western things stuck in it. You see, and so it was like a completely different book. Therefore, you cannot. Um, therefore, the things that you say and the language that they are said in are, are inseparable. And saying something in Thai will never be able to translate that exactly into another language. Um, if if you ask me whether objective reality exists, which is sort of outside the scope of this talk, I would say this, well, in, in one of my novels, uh, 
uh, Vampire Junction. They're sitting around at the end, uh, having destroyed the universe and so on. And, um, and one of the characters said, says to the other character that truth is only the prevailing percentage of our private illusions. Now, I believe that is probably the truth. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for the presentation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as we head on to the final part of the awards presentation ceremony.